Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next installment in our series, Dr. Gilbert Hosts. My name is Dr. Rebecca Gilbert, and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at American Parkinson Disease Association. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am very excited about today's guest who's with us, Dr. Ka Carly Tanner. Dr. Tanner is a professor of neurology at University of California, San Francisco, and is well known for her contributions to our understanding about how environmental toxins influence Parkinson's disease risk. And we'll be talking her today, with her today about Parkinson's disease and the environment. Dr. Tanner will first give a brief overview of the topic, and then we'll be taking your questions. American Parkinson's Disease Association, or APDA for short, is the largest grassroots network dedicated to fighting Parkinson's disease and works tirelessly to assist the more than 1 million people with Parkinson's disease in the United States live life to the fullest. Please visit our website at apdaparkinson.org to explore all that we have to offer. You can contact APDA through our toll-free helpline, 1-800-223-2732, as well as via our social media outlets. And now I'd like to formally introduce my guest. Dr. Carolyn Tanner trained in neurology and movement disorders at Rush University in Chicago. She received her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. She directed clinical research at the Parkinson's Institute from 1990 to 2013, and is now professor of neurology at the University of California, San Francisco. She's also the associate director of research at the Parkinson's Disease Research Education and Clinical Center at the San Francisco VA. Dr. Tanner's research has identified associations between exposures, including certain pesticides, solvents, and environmental pollutants, and the increased risk of Parkinson's disease. She's also identified gene-environment interactions, and these are all topics that we can talk about today. I am so excited to be talking with Dr. Tanner. Dr. Tanner, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to your introduction, and then we'll go on to our Q&A with our audience. Dr. Tanner. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to speak with everyone today, albeit uh, via computer. And uh, I'm going to start by just giving a really uh, quick overview of some of the work that my colleagues and I have done uh, looking for risk factors in Parkinson's. And then we can really delve into this in the questions and um, dig into the things that you're really interested in hearing about. Um, so uh, this is a cartoon that shows some of the risk factors that have been associated with a greater risk of developing Parkinson's. So everybody's familiar, I think, with the fact that more men than women get Parkinson's. And, uh, you know, that's an interesting question we, we need to spend a lot more time trying to understand. Um, the other things are things that, uh, oh, and the, and the last bit is, of course, uh, it's, it's a disorder that increases with increasing age. So um, it's more common in people who are in their uh, seventh or eighth decade than people who are in their fourth or fifth decade, for example. Um, the other thing is uh, there are many, many different exposures that have been associated with greater risk of Parkinson's. So uh, among these are pesticides, and there are a number of different uh, specific pesticides that have been associated with Parkinson's risk, including uh, Paraquat, Rotenone, uh, various organochlorine pesticides, um, some suggestion that perhaps organophosphate uh, pesticides may be associated. There's a little bit of evidence that polychlorinated biphenyls, which have been used in uh, electrical capacitance uh, industry, may be associated with Parkinson's disease. And then also evidence that exposure to chlorinated solvents, so trichloroethylene or perchloroethylene or PERC or TCE, um, are associated with greater risk of Parkinson's. So these are all things that are what we call environmentally persistent, meaning um, they uh, accumulate and stick around in the environment. They're very hard to get out of the water or the soil. And so some of these are things, for example, the solvents that people may be uh, exposed to through uh, exposure to water, even if you yourself never worked in an industry or in a, in a setting where you use these kinds of solvents. So that's another tricky thing about looking at exposures and Parkinson's risk. Um, 
Military veterans um, may have had specific kinds of exposures due to their military service. And some of these are exposure to toxicants. Um, another risk for Parkinson's disease is head injury. And um, many people who have been deployed have been in settings, especially where um, they've been exposed to blasts or other settings where they, they may have uh, head injury uh, associated with their service. There's a suggestion that exposure to metals and maybe particularly manganese um, may increase Parkinson's risk. And there are certain types of welding that may also increase people's exposure to uh, manganese fumes. And it's been suggested that people doing that kind of welding may also have a greater Parkinson's risk. Uh, air pollution is, Kind of hard to study, but there is a little bit of evidence that exposure to air pollution, and here it's all the different components of air pollution have individually or collectively been suggested to be associated with Parkinson's. And then an important one is that physical inactivity. So people who are not as physically active are at greater risk of uh, developing Parkinson's disease. So this is just kind of the big overview, but the, the catch is many, many people have these exposures and yet only some of those people actually get Parkinson's. So it suggests this, this is a complex problem. It's more than just simply these risk factors. Um, and it leads us to the idea that Parkinson's is in fact a complex disorder. And while risk factor exposure is important, um, other factors are also important. So could we move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, and so the idea is that, um, as I said, Parkinson's is a complex disorder with your genetic substrate, who you are, how you were born, how your body can handle these different exposures is important in terms of determining whether or not you're actually gonna get Parkinson's disease. So we say genetics loads the gun, but um, environment pulls the trigger. So if you just have this sort of predisposition, you may never get Parkinson's. And it's the other things that happen to you or that you do during life that, that predispose to it. This leads to the idea that purely genetic PD is rare, purely environmental PD is rare. And most people um, usually are, it's gonna be the combination of genetics and environment. So what you're born with, what your natural characteristics are, and then what happens to you during life that mean you are the, you are going to get Parkinson's. Um, the, the good news is that this is a very hopeful finding. For one thing, we can change environment, meaning we can change the big environment around us, but we can also change our behavior and you know what we expose ourselves to through our, um, our activities. And Increasingly, as you may know, we're also getting to be a little bit better at thinking at least about targeting some of the things that we can identify genetically. So I think it's a very hopeful time for thinking about preventing Parkinson's disease. And preventing Parkinson's disease is something that when I started many years ago, wasn't even, we didn't even say that, right? And I'm so excited that now at this sort of later point of my career, that this is something that I'm really actively working on. So one way to do this is primary prevention. That means people maintain their state of health, nothing changes, Parkinson's doesn't even get, get a, any kind of a start in the body. And so that's you know, our primary goal. And some of that might be by environmental cleanup, not having exposures to things, but that's also kind of a big deal to be able to think about doing that on a planetary basis. We'd love it, but may not be tomorrow. Um, secondary prevention, which is something we're spending a lot of time working on, means you can identify people at risk and do something so that they don't get Parkinson's, they don't manifest the motor features, or we're increasingly recognizing that there are these prodromal features that for many people come before the actual Parkinson's diagnosis, like loss of sense of smell or rapid eye movement of sleep behavior disorder. And for that, we can maybe target those people and do something, give them a treatment, intervene with behaviors that mean that you slow or stop the progression of Parkinson's disease. And so we're really actively working in that area right now. It's a very, very active area of research. And then 
even for people who have Parkinson's, prevention is also important. We can prevent the progression of the disease. We can prevent the development of some of the more severe side effects or characteristics of the disease. That's also very, very important. So at every stage of this diagram, prevention is um, extremely important and it's very exciting to be able to talk about it. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about one of the pesticides, Paraqua, which is one of the ones that um, we've spent some time studying as have others. It's one that has maybe some of the stronger evidence suggesting that if you have a paraquat exposure, you have a greater risk of Parkinson's disease. And it's particularly relevant to those of us who live in the US because it, around the world, um, in the Euro European Union, for example, um, Paraquat's been banned for a long period of time. While in the US um, and in some other countries in the world, it's actually had increasing use. And I think this diagram, which is the, the bar chart over there on, on the right that says use by year and crop, you see how it's kind of going up over to the right? Well, the right I think ends in 2015 and it's still going up after that. So. The use in the US is um, increasing, which means that we all may have the opportunity to be exposed to paraquat um, uh, in recent time. And so that's important. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit in uh, the work that we did in the agricultural health study, um, which was studying uh, a population of farmers and their wives who've been studied over time. And because they're business people, they're farmers, they record and have to report their pesticide use. And so in that case, um, we were able to understand what they did and then also uh, be able to look at things that may have had a positive effect in preventing Parkinson's, even in people who were exposed, in this case, to paraquat, I'll use this as my example. And so the first example of this is um, diet. And so this is something that's important to think about because this is something anyone can do. And so what we did is we looked at the relationship between Parkinson's disease, paraquat, and diet. And we looked at what's called a healthy diet that was sort of set up by nutritional epidemiologists. We asked people what they ate and recorded their typical diets. And we also looked at their uh, exposure to, in this case, paraquat, how much paraquat they mixed or applied in the farm. And what we found was that people who had paraquat exposure, even if they had a healthy diet, if they had a healthy diet, didn't have a very great risk of Parkinson's, while people had both paraquat use and an unhealthy diet had more than a four and a half times greater risk of Parkinson's. So the take home from this is that these are things that you can control and that you can, can do yourself that may actually have a benefit even if you're exposed to a toxicant. We had another example um, where we looked at uh, protective behaviors. And so here, what we did is we looked at the risk of paraquat um, causing Parkinson's um, in people who are mixing or applying uh, pesticides. So we looked at personal protective equipment, masks, gloves, or respirators. And what we found is that people who used PPE when they were mixing or applying pesticides, washed off if they had a spill, things like that, really didn't have a very great increased risk for Parkinson's. So that's that little blue bar and one means no increase. And you notice the red bar, which is almost up at four. So four means four times the risk of having Parkinson's. And these are people who didn't use PPE. Um, and so it's another great take home. Um, big extension is if we got all this paraquat out of the environment in total, would prevent Parkinson's, that's kind of a no brainer. But little take home is for people who are in a setting where you're mixing or applying or you know doing jobs that may relate to paraquat and possibly other toxicants. If you're careful, you can certainly dramatically reduce your risk. So I think these are really positive statements um, that are just important for all of us to remember. And then 
there's another really big factor that is important for everyone in so many ways, and that's physical activity. One of the things that we know is that people who had more physical activity, and in some studies where they looked at this, it was just simple things like when you go to work, walking to public transportation, it wasn't just exercise, which is purposeful physical activity, even just being more active in, in a kind of a general way, reduce the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. The other thing we know, and there are trials right now that are looking at this in, in, in greater detail, are that even if you have Parkinson's, if you exercise, you can slow the rate of progression of your Parkinson's disease. And so I think these are really, really important take homes. This is a little model that we developed and, and um, published looking at the sort of a what if, right? And so what we did is we started with how many people in the US do we think have Parkinson's? And we sort of did a guesstimate from a number of different populations and said it's about 700,000 people in 2010. And then we said, if people exercise, it's just 20% of people exercise less or exercise more, I'm sorry, um, we would reduce Parkinson's by, and that's that little um, orange bar, right? So Parkinson's is increasing in the US. If 20% more people exercised adults, it would re reduce a little bit. And if 80% exercised, you would see that very bottom bar. So a very dramatic decrease in the number of people in the population with Parkinson's. So that's really, uh, I think an important take home for everyone because that's something that passively, just changing your activity a little bit, taking the stairs, not the elevator, walking to the grocery store if it's nearby instead of getting in your car and driving, those are all things you can do that can make a big difference. So, Back to where we started, preventing Parkinson's disease, I think is something that we all really want to focus on. Our hope is that we can address some of these risk factors for people who are now not in uh, the Parkinson's, uh, who don't have Parkinson's disease and prevent them from getting it. For people who are in a prodromal phase where some of the disease process is starting to be able to prevent the manifestations of um, full-blown Parkinson's. And for that, there are you know, a lot of treatment trials that are starting to think about targeting people in the prodromal phase. There are trials that are starting to think about identifying people at this point only with genetic risks and maybe targeting them. And then importantly, for people who already have Parkinson's disease, there also are things that we can do to prevent some of the worst outcomes that can be related to Parkinson's. And I just wanna mention this to this group. This is a study I'm leading with colleagues who are experts in bone health. And um, we're targeting the fact that fractures are increased three or four times more in people with Parkinson's than other people of the same age and sex. And part of that is because um, bone health, people have more uh, what we call osteoporosis or weak bones when they have Parkinson's. The other thing is that people with Parkinson's fall. So that's a bad combination. Um, and yet people with Parkinson's are very unlikely to be treated with drugs that, that help to prevent fractures. So this is a home-based study. You can go to that website right there, the topazstudy.org, um, and you walk through a couple of screening questions and you give consent um, online, and then uh, you'll be contacted by uh, our team. And if you qualify for the study, and almost everyone does, um, it's a very, very broad inclusion. Then we'll set up a visit for a nurse to come into the home. We may do a video visit with you first by telemedicine just to confirm your eligibility. And it's a one-time infusion of a drug that um, can uh, strengthen the bones and we hope prevent fractures. And so we, we hope to come up with a model that says this prevents fractures in people with Parkinson's, but also a way that it could be easier for people to get treated because rather than going to the doctor or having to take pills all the time, it's a single infusion and lasts for a couple of years. So that's another kind of prevention. 
And um, I just want to bring that up as well as an important opportunity for everybody. So um, that's really all I wanted to say as my overview. There's plenty more to talk about, obviously. And uh, I look forward to hearing your questions and being able to have a, a conversation. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Tanner, for that excellent introduction. We are now ready for our Q&A. Now, we have a number of questions that have already been submitted to start off uh, our discussion. But if you're participating live, we really invite you to ask your questions now. And you can uh, ask your questions using the live chat um, in uh, whatever uh, medium you're using now to view our presentation. So in order per to participate, you will need to be logged in to either YouTube or Facebook, and we may display your question as well as your name. So be aware of that. And so let's start off. We have um, a great question from uh, Thomas. Um, and his question is, he had an exposure uh, to an, um, he, does, he doesn't mention which exposure, but he had an exposure 30 years ago. Um, would an exposure 30 years ago be relevant to Parkinson's disease now? And how to think about that in the terms of time frame? Yes, thank you for asking that. That's a really important question. And um, we know that there is a long period of time that uh, occurs before the full-blown symptoms of Parkinson's are um, able to be diagnosed, before you can, you know, you have tremor or slowness and get that diagnosis. And we think it's at least 10 years. Um, there are many things that um, people can have as symptoms that come before the full-blown uh, diagnosis of Parkinson's, like constipation and loss of sense of smell or acting out your dreams, rapid eye movement, sleep behavior disorder, uh, changes in your skin, seborrheic dermatitis. And some people have those things um, for decades before their final diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Um, we're not sure exactly when that process begins, but in many of these settings, 20 or 30 years and from exposure to Parkinson's would not be unusual. So well, I can't say in your case, I'm sure that's for sure. Um, certainly in our population studies, that's something that we see. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Now we have a question here from Jacqueline and I think it um, opens up a, a specific topic that many people are interested in. She asks about her husband, he worked in downtown Chicago for 40 years, would air pollution be a factor in his in his Parkinson's disease? And she also mentions that he lived in a trailer park alongside an industrial area um, and would that be uh, a, a problem? And maybe you can use this example to um, talk about a person's individual risks, every, every single person that's listening has a specific uh, set of exposures that they're aware of and how that matches up with uh, the population in general and maybe address individual versus population risks. Yeah, no, those are, those are great questions to ask. And um, it, it's really tricky. It's almost impossible to look at one person and say, your Parkinson's came from this. Um, we look in our in our studies at whole populations. So we'll say, if you lived, there are a number of studies that actually say, if you lived in an area where there was a lot of air pollution, your risk of getting Parkinson's is greater than someone who is theoretically just like you, but lived in an area where there wasn't a lot of air pollution. So um, we can look in that way and show that some of these things are definitely associated with what we call a greater risk. So you're three times more likely or four times more likely to get Parkinson's. But we can't look at any one individual and say, I know that your Parkinson's was caused by living in an area that had air pollution or water pollution uh, because we don't have any blood tests or other measurements that allow us to really look at that in an individual personal way. So we always have to sort of come up with these um, probability statements sort of like, yeah, it's like a good chance that that was one of the factors that contributed to your Parkinson's. We also know that, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, everybody individually has um, different ways of being able to process or break down exposures to toxicants and 
different people have other different sort of environmental factors that, that accrue during life. So um, if you had a head injury, you played contact sports in high school. If you, um, uh, you know, ate uh, not a typical, you know, sort of Mediterranean diet, if you weren't as physically active, those might all modify the way uh, an environmental exposure uh, affects you as well. So it's complicated. And usually it's what we call multifactorial. There are a lot of different factors that contribute. I know that's frustrating on a personal level, but sort of where we're at right now. Yeah. It is very complicated and uh, and very hard to very hard to process. But thank you for that excellent explanation. We have a question here from Jackie, um, and her question is: Why are scientists loath to say that chemicals such as paraquat and rhodonone cause Parkinson's when these Parkinson's are used to induce Parkinson's in lab animals? And maybe you can talk more generally about whether you think scientists are loath to um, to blame uh, pesticides and what your opinion is about uh, scientists' uh, interaction with this this topic in general. Hi, Jackie. <laughs> um, sure. Um, well, not all scientists are loath to say that, but I think that, um, you know, part of it is that there, there is some conservatism in science because people want to be sure um, that what they're saying really makes sense. And as you point out, one of the ways we try to understand this is in lab animals, right? So the way scientists figure things out is they say, let's change one thing. We'll take this group of animals and give them paraquat. We'll take this group of animals and not give them paraquat. And then we'll look at, you know, their brains and see if there are changes that are similar to Parkinson's. You can do that in lab animals. We certainly don't do that in people, right? And we never would ever want to do anything like that. But um, therefore, it makes it very complicated to compare one person to another and be sure that, you know, one single factor is related to their Parkinson's. And I think that's part of it. Scientists are conservative. I think the other part of it is that um, there's a lot of um, politics kind of and um, you know public health and policy factors that would be related to uh, implicating specific chemicals or specific pesticides. Um, there are regulatory aspects. So something's regulated and therefore can't come to the market anymore that has economic implications and um, it's hard to make those changes. It's a lot easier to say, you need to make a change yourself in your behavior or here's a brand new treatment we're developing we can give to you that will like make everything go away. So I think that's the other part of it. Um, there are a lot of implications that are, are um, challenging uh, from a societal level. Thank you. We have a number of questions related to veterans that are coming in. We have a question from Kendra here. Um, so Kendra is a young onset Parkinson's disease woman who was diagnosed at the age of 42 and she served in the military uh, for a number of years. Um, could you discuss uh, the connection between uh, military service and uh, developing Parkinson's and what, uh, what Kendra uh, should be doing? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll say for one thing, um, I would suggest if you haven't already that um, you go to uh, VA and get an environmental exam. So there are environmental health doctors at VA um, who can help to understand whether any aspect of your military service might be uh, something that would qualify you for a service-related disability. And there, there are several different, very specific um, service-related exposures um, that are presumed by the VA. So some of you around the VA will have heard of presumptions. So they're presumed to be associated with Parkinson's. And the reason they're called presumptions is what I just said before. We don't have any way on an individual basis to be 100% sure that your Parkinson's was caused by something you did in the service. But looking at the big global evidence, the VA has decided that certain kinds of exposures, there's enough evidence to suggest that at least some of the people who got Parkinson's and had that military experience maybe got Parkinson's because of their service. And so that's that's the way the VA approaches it. So I would suggest that um, you take advantage of that. Um, it's also true that the presumptions are pretty limited. And um, you may have had an exposure in the service that's just like something, but if you weren't in the right place at the right time, 
this is the VA. It's kind of like the army or the military. Um, they're going to say, nope, it's this one over here, but not that one over there. I'll say that, um, especially in the area of Agent Orange, which is uh, Vietnam era exposure to a, uh, an herbicide um, that has been looked at a lot, um, there's been a lot of advocacy in the veterans community and the broader community as a whole. And so understanding of the numbers of people with those exposures has kind of grown over time. And the presumption, the people who are eligible for, for benefits because of that has also grown over time. So there is um, a little role for advocacy uh, in that area as well in terms of um, kind of making it clear that some of these exposures that likely relate to Parkinson's risk are things that happen during your service um, that you can kind of, um, on an individual as well as a broader level, uh, be an advocate for that. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, so we have a general question um, that uh, is very relevant to this topic in general, which is, so if you had um, you know, substantial environmental risk in the past and you think that's related, to the development of Parkinson's, is Parkinson's treated any differently because of that environmental factor? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and right now the answer is no, um, it isn't. Um, part of it is that it's it's really very hard to know um, what factors people have been exposed to in a broad way. The studies that I've, I've talked about are ones where we we talked to people and took really detailed histories of their occupations and what they did during their occupations during life and where they lived. And then we worked with people who are experts, who are industrial hygienists, who could say, yes, if somebody worked in that industry at that time period doing this job task, their likely exposure was to this set of chemicals. And the reason is that most people can't really look back, even if they worked in an industry and they had to take certain precautions, they can't look back and say, well, in you know, 1980, we did this. And in 1990, we did this. And I had these exposures. People don't know. So it's really hard to know the specific details. And because we can't put people in categories and say, this is a group of people who are exposed to solvents. This is a group who are exposed to pesticides and see how different they are, it's hard to tell whether they need different treatments. So that's a long roundabout way of saying, I think we maybe would like to be able to do that, but right now we don't have enough information uh, to be able to separate out groups of people uh, and treat them differently because of the different causes. Okay, fantastic. We have a, a question from a dog lover. Uh, thank you for identifying yourself uh, as dog lover. Um, have you heard of any studies linking computer use to Parkinson's risk? What an interesting question. Um, no, <laughs> I have not. Uh, isn't that interesting? Um, no, I, I really haven't heard anyone say that. Um, but in this era of Zoom, <laughs> <laughs> and social isolation. I think we all need to think about that. Yeah, you know, I haven't. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, that's good to know and reassuring. That's fantastic. We have a number of questions related to gene um, risk factors. So many people are asking. So if you have Parkinson's disease in your family, if your mother has it, what are your uh, chances of getting Parkinson's? Perhaps you can discuss the, what question from um, Saima. What is the risk of getting Parkinsonism if your mother has Parkinsonism? Um, and so maybe you could address uh, that aspect of risk factors in Parkinson's, which we haven't really discussed yet, um, and maybe how that ties in to, um, to the environmental exposures we're talking about. Yeah, that's a, good, a great, great set of questions. So thanks for asking that. So um, the relationship between genes, so what, you know, you're born with in your DNA, something that is inherited uh, from your parents and Parkinson's has a couple of different layers. So the first one is there are some genes that are, have a pretty strong association with developing Parkinson's. So Parkinson's clearly runs in generations of a family and you can see uh, different patterns that we call either a dominant inheritance, so it comes from parent to child to their child, that kind of every generation 
having a Parkinson's case in it is called dominant inheritance. There are a few genes that are like that. Um, most of them are extremely rare. Um, there are two that are um, more, a little bit more common, but in the U.S. still make up only less, way less than 10% of the people uh, with Parkinson's. Um, one of these is called LRRK2, and the other one is called uh, GBA. And um, in these cases, not everybody who has this specific change in their gene actually gets Parkinson's. So even there, what we call gene environment interaction seems to be important. And we actually just um, reported a study looking at people with one of these mutations in the LRK2 gene, or LARC2 as people often call it. And um, people who used, um, anti-inflammatory drugs during life because the mechanism for this seems to be an inflammatory process, at least in part. And people who just for some other reason happen to have a, a time course of anti-inflammatory drugs seem to be at lower risk of getting Parkinson's even if they had this gene mutation that is strongly associated with Parkinson's risk. We talk about what we call penetrance um, when we look at genes and Parkinson's. Penetrance means if you have that gene mutation that's associated with Parkinson's, how likely are you to get Parkinson's on average? And penetrance for like LRK2, for example, is somewhere around 30 to 40%. So it's not that high. So things can pass from families, but even then you may not get it. Then there's the other relationship between genes and Parkinson's, and that's a lot more complicated. So lots of genes working together can have very small relationships to Parkinson's risk, and adding them all up together can give you a, a greater risk of getting Parkinson's. And here again, we're talking maybe 10 to 15% increased risk. We're not talking a, like a really dramatically increased risk. And then the last way that genes can relate to your Parkinson's risk is what we call gene environment interaction. And in that case, we look at something like a gene that helps your body break down an exposure to something like paraquat. And if your body, doesn't have a metabolic gene that's really good at breaking down paraquat, you could be exposed the same amount as the person next to you and be at greater risk of Parkinson's because your body's not as good, as good at like detoxifying as, as breaking down that, that environmental exposure. So those are the different ways that genes work. Where it gets back to when you say, my mom has Parkinson's, do I? Is that um, one way you can try to understand a little bit about your risk is to actually get some genetic testing. So you could have your mom, if she's willing, could be tested. And you could see if she has any of the genes that are known to be associated with Parkinson's and your doctor, your neurologist can, can help you with this. Um, and then if you wanted to, and I would suggest if you wanna do all this, you work with a genetic counselor to understand kind of the, the pros and cons of it before you just launch. You yourself could get tested and see, do I have that same genetic risk? And if you do, there are things that you may be able to do in terms of behavior and lifestyle. You can do those without the test, actually, a lot of them. Uh, but for some genes these days, there may also be treatments that are very specific to that gene. And that may be something you want to think about and decide whether that's something you want to uh, avail yourself of. Right now, it's all experimental. It's all clinical trials, but um, maybe something that would be worth considering. Fantastic. I know that's on a lot of people's minds, uh, genes and genetic testing and how it all relates to environmental risk factors. It's just very, very complicated. Um, we have mm -hmm. a question here from Jackie. Um, is anyone in the research community doing body burden studies on PD? So the idea is uh, looking at, uh, at people with PD and seeing if they have forever chemicals in their bodies. Is anyone studying PD in that way? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know of a way to do that. Um, there are lots and lots of chemicals. Um, some of them are what we call lipid soluble. So they may be concentrated in um, the body fat stores. Um, but there are other ones that may not be 
persistent in the body, but may have triggered some kind of an action that then just kind of continues, made a change, and then, you know, increased what we call inflammatory stress, set up a kind of a vicious cycle, and then isn't still there. So um, I am not aware of anyone who's really, a I'm not aware of the technology actually that's able to do that um, at this point. But it would be very interesting if that uh, once that technology is developed to see what we sure would. Yeah, uh, we have a question here, uh, a general question. Um, so you researched this topic of uh, environmental risk factors in PD extensively, and what type of precautions do you take in your life to minimize your risk of Parkinson's? Yeah, so I've kind of alluded to some of the things that people can do, but I think you know most of the things that you can do are not just good in preventing Parkinson's, but they're good in general for, for health. So one thing is that um, as much as possible, I buy organic or grow your own, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables if you're in a setting where you can do that. Um, I know it's a little bit more expensive, but um, feeling more confident that you're not having inadvertent exposures, I think is important. Um, I personally also, I'm lucky I got in California, so it makes life a lot easier. But, um, you know, I try to buy local. I don't buy things that, you know, come in from other places. Um, but sometimes there, there are clearly good organic things that you can get from other places. So those, those are some of the dietary things you can do. Um, the other thing is that there's a fair amount of evidence that suggests that diets that are one, one type of diet is called the Mediterranean diet. So it's high um, in uh, fruits and uh, vegetables and whole grains and um, uh, olive oil, polyunsaturated um, fats and low in um, animal fats and um, uh, those lower in red meat and you know higher in fish or uh, poultries, whiter meats. Um, so that general kind of diet, there are various versions of it, depending on where people live in the world, has in a number of different studies been suggested to also be associated with a lower risk of Parkinson's. So that again is a kind of a healthy diet uh, that people can try to um, ascribe to. The other thing that's really important is physical activity. And as I said, it's um, just being mindful of what you do as you go about your day, um, not just exercising, which is important, uh, definitely important to have, you know, regular exercise, aerobic exercise seems to be important. So getting your heart rate up and not um, just stretching and um, doing those kinds of exercises or weight, weight training exercises. So doing aerobic physical activity, but also just moving, right? So using your daily activities to give yourself some sort of, uh, you know, free exercises is also really important. So um, people ask me what kind of exercise and I say the one that you're going to do is the one <laughs> that's the right kind. So if you, you know, love swimming and hate running, go swimming. You know, if you like dance, do dance, you know, whatever, whatever works, but something that kind of gets your heart rate up several times a week. Great advice. Great advice. So we have a question here uh, about the increased risk of Parkinson's disease in urban versus rural living. So urban being air pollutants and rural living being pesticides. What is what is better, living on a farm or in a city? Yeah, so that's a, a question with no real answer um, at this point. Um, we don't know in, in the U.S. Um, sort of what the map of where people are who have Parkinson's, that, that it does not exist. And you'd kind of need to have a map like that over decades to sort of look at the comparisons between living in the country, living, you know, living in the city and what relate, what caused a greater risk of Parkinson's. So I think we've talked about risks that are greater in both places. And, um, it's hard to, I can't, I can't make a vote. <laughs> <laughs> All right then, so no one has to move, so that's good. Um, Carolyn asks, Parkinson's disease has a history that's far older than industrial environmental toxins. So are there natural elements such as, such as fungal pathogens that may be responsible for Parkinson's disease? 
Now, that's a really astute question, and I've, I've thought about that uh, a fair amount myself. It's one of the reasons, one of the ways that people have argued, well, there can't be any environmental factors related to Parkinson's, because look, it was described long ago in these ancient texts. Um, so there are a couple of points to that. Um, one is that 1817 was the Industrial Revolution just sort of ramping up in England, and that's kind of when um, James Parkinson's described Parkinson's disease. So while it did possibly exist before, it may be much more frequent in the subsequent decades. We can't ever say that for sure. Lots of other things were changing, including, you know, medical care and recognition of disease. So, but that's a possibility, right? Um, genetic forms of Parkinson's would have existed prior to any environmental exposure. So it could be that some of those old reports that you read in the ancient texts were describing a genetic form of Parkinsonism, an inherited form of Parkinsonism, and not an environmentally associated form of Parkinsonism. So that's an, another possibility. It's also true when you read those ancient texts, which I can't say I've done, you know, because I'm a scholar and can read the old text. So I'm reading translations. But when you read the words that people said, a lot of times it's not so clear that it's actually Parkinson's disease they're describing. They're describing tremor. And there are a lot of tremors or they're describing stiffness and slowness. And while, you know, that's part of Parkinson's, it can be part of a lot of other things too. So, so that's another uh, question uh, that, uh, I think we'll just never be able to answer. So we, you know, kind of depending on which way you want to look at it, you can interpret those things uh, to favor your own thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Topaz study that you mentioned at the end. Myra is curious, is the Topaz study open throughout the country? You mentioned a nurse comes in, you get an infusion. Can this happen anywhere in the US? It's a national study. So um, most people in the U.S. would be eligible. eligible. I'll say we have a little bit of a limitation. This is a, a study like all with budgets, right? So it's federally funded. And um, if you live in a place where there aren't very many people, um, we may not be able to afford to send a nurse out just to the middle of a, you know, a, a state where there's nobody else. So our nurses, we kind of, you know, do a geographical cluster to try to distribute them. So that's the only caveat. It's not that you wouldn't be eligible. It's that we might not be able to afford to send a nurse to your home if you live far from other people with Parkinson's who, who might also be enrolled in the study. Otherwise, um, it's, a, it's a national study. So... Yeah, so at least go on the website and let us talk to you. And if you're interested and it sounds interesting to you once, you once you read about it, you know, we can talk to you and figure out if it seems like you're likely uh, to be able to, to be involved or not, right? Most people, it would be a yes. Perfect, perfect. So si sign up and see if you can yeah. join. Fantastic. Um, we have a question here from Patty, and this actually raises uh, an issue we haven't talked about yet. One of the side effects of Parkinson's is constipation. So how do you feel that uh, how gut health plays uh, a role in this? If you have good gut health, does that help in uh, increasing or decreasing your risk of Parkinson's disease? Great question. And that, if this is another area of research that we're trying to figure out. And it's another aspect of genes in Parkinson's. And in this case, it's not your genes necessarily. It's the genes of the microbiome of those organisms that are living on your skin and in your GI tract and how they may also uh, metabolize both things you eat uh, but also um, things that you're exposed to, right? So if you're exposed to chemicals, they they get into your your mouth and into your stomach and you know onto your skin. So um, having a healthy gut, we think, um, is really important both for uh, possibly for reducing risk of Parkinson's, and also if you do have Parkinson's disease, um, it may affect. 
um, your health in a number of ways, both in terms of how you can metabolize your normal nutrients in your diet, also in terms of how you may be able to take in and use your Parkinson's medication. So one of the studies that we're actually doing um, at UCSF is looking at um, the microbiome in the GI tract. We're working with a person who's an expert in, in um, that area and the, the bacteria that normally live in your GI tract um, to try to uh, minimize having too many of the bacteria that break down the levodopa in cinemat so that it can't be absorbed into the body. So we're we're trying to look at whether, you know, sort of fixing the microbiome in that way may improve responsiveness to medication in people with Parkinson's. Fantastic. Very on point question, Patty. Thank you. Um, so we have another question. Uh, as I noticed that your Paraquat paper was published in 2012. Why are people only talking about Paraquat now? Why has it taken 10 years for people to be um, talking about Paraquat and Parkinson's? What are your thoughts on that? No. Well, it's a good question. I mean, uh, somebody asked a question kind of like this before that um, there's a lot of reluctance to focus on this area of uh, research uh, in relationship to Parkinson's risk. Um, wasn't even easy to get that paper published, honestly. Um, so um, I can't say exactly, but um, I think it's sort of the same answer that, that I gave before. It's, it's um, a lot easier to look at the individual to say, oh, it's your genes, oh, it's your metabolism, oh, it's your behavior. It's a lot harder to say some of these other things out there that have societal implications um, may be related to the some aspect of your risk of disease. Okay, fantastic. Um, we have a question from Mrs. Gooch, and this uh, relates to radioactive waste, which we haven't uh, talked about yet. Any relationship uh, between radioactive waste and developing PD? Um, she mentions uh, playing on a softball field that was later closed because of radioactive waste. What are your thoughts on yeah, that? So there, there is no definitive evidence of that to my knowledge at this point. Um, people tried to look at it a little bit um, in Japan in uh, people who had exposures um, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and it was never completely clear, but it was really hard to do that kind of study. Um, there's a little bit of interest in trying to look at that um, from uh, people who may have had exposures through their military service. So that's that's a, a, a bit of research that people are looking at. Um, so I, I can't say no, but I can't say yes at this point. To my knowledge, there's not been a, a, a real study yet, but I think it's an important question to ask and to sort of encourage people to, to research that. Very good. So we have a question from Dee, which is I know on many people's minds, you mentioned that um, uh, male sex increases risk of Parkinson's disease. Is there a difference in progression of Parkinson's disease between men and women? Do you suggest that maybe Parkinson's and uh, women uh, progress faster than men? Um, can you address that? Yeah, so um, really interesting uh, question. And there's a lot of interest that people are starting to pay to this question now. Um, there's a little bit of evidence that suggests that some of the medication related side effects like dyskinesias may be more common in women, um, whether that's because of your um, female sex, or if that's because women in general are smaller than men. And so they're getting a kind of a bigger dose of lipidopa. I don't know, people are still uh, trying to figure that out. Um, there is a little more controversial evidence. So some studies suggest that other aspects of Parkinson's progress more rapidly and others that it progress more slowly in women. So um, this is just something we were actively trying to look at now in a systematic way. I don't think the answer is finally in. And the data kind of go in both ways. There is a little bit of a suggestion, at least, um, that cognitive decline in Parkinson's may be more, may come sooner and happen more rapidly in men than women. But again, if you look at all the studies, you can find one that says this and one that says that. So this is actually an active area of research where a number of us are trying to put together um, 
information from lots of studies and pool them and see if we can come up with a better answer than you get from any one small group of uh, people in a single study. Very good, very good. We are just about the end of our hour, which is uh, very unfortunate since uh, there's been so much information and uh, I know that there are many more questions that people have. Um, we have maybe time for one last question, uh, and this is from uh, Myra, which is uh, really an excellent on-point question. Have the countries who no longer use Paraquat shown a reduction in the number of people with PD? Yeah, so that is a great, great question. You're right. And there's not much evidence, but there's a tiny little bit of evidence um, that, so starting backwards, um, there aren't very many places where we have really good population statistics for how many people have PD, including in the US. So we have to look at little places. And one of the places in the US is Olmsted County, Minnesota, around the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, where they've been um, recording people with Parkinson's in that county since the mid 50s, 1950s. Um, there, there's another place where people have been looking um, in the Netherlands, and they've also been looking not for quite that long, but systematically over a period of time. The most recent reports from Olmsted County show increasing risk of people with Parkinson's, increasing numbers of people with Parkinson's, and in the Netherlands, reducing numbers of people with Parkinson's. That happens to be one of the places where Paraquat and other pesticides have been strongly regulated um, compared to the US where that's not the case. So those are really, you know, not one-on-one -on -one direct answers to your questions, but it's a little bit of evidence to suggest there may be something different there. Very good. All right. With that, we have to end our Q&A. Our hour is up. And I want to thank you so much, Dr. Tanner, for your information, your presentation. And I also want to thank everyone who participated in today's discussion and participated in the question and answer. It's really very helpful for everyone. And if you know someone who missed today's program, if you joined late, if you would like to watch again, this recording will be available later today on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to subscribe to APDZ, APDA YouTube channel you could, where you can watch uh, this video and others and also be aware of our live broadcasts. For additional information and resources, please visit our website at apdaparkinson.org. The next episode of Dr. Gilbert Hosts will be held on Wednesday, August 4th at noon, and I will be hosting Dr. Britt Stone for a Q&A about complementary therapies and Parkinson's disease. What are the roles of therapies such as acupuncture, massage, and yoga in managing PD? And you'll be able, again, to ask your questions live so you can make informed decisions about your care. So please join us, and you can register for that session as well as many other virtual programs using our virtual calendar on our website. So you can go to apdaparkinson.org slash events scroll to August 4th and register for our next Dr. Gilbert Hosts event. If you enjoyed today's program, we hope you'll consider supporting APDA with a donation because with your help, APDA can deliver more programs and services like this one. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We hope to see you soon on another APDA program. Please have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>